Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get underway. Good afternoon both to those who are in the room and to those who are joining us uh, online or following the, the webcast. I uh, would like to say uh, good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this session, marking yesterday's International Day of Persons with Disabilities, and in particular, its theme on promoting the participation of persons with disabilities and their leadership, taking action on the 2030 Development Agenda. Now, when we learned of the theme for this year's International Day, in light of our role as a proud co-founder and secretariat for the Equals Global Partnership on Gender Equality in the Digital Age, we immediately thought of preparing a session on women with disabilities leading in tech. And we are so thrilled that so many wonderful organizations have joined forces today to make this event possible, celebrating women with disabilities in tech and initiatives that support women with disabilities in tech careers. As we all know, it's an understatement to say that the tech sector is fast growing and there are enormous career opportunities. It is also well established by so many studies that diversity and inclusion is not just right and fair, it also adds business value, including in terms of innovation and profitability. Too often when we think of a technologist, the default image that may pop into our heads has been of a young man in a hooded sweatshirt. However, to quote Melinda Gates, not every great idea comes wrapped in a hoodie. While there are a lot of such men, there are also a lot of women leading the way, diverse women with different backgrounds, ethnicities, women with or without disabilities, and companies, other organizations, the world, and the SDGs need many more of them. The session today will be wide ranging. We'll hear from women with disabilities who are leaders in tech here in the US, in Turkey, Kenya, and the UK, from women who've founded organizations that leverage tech in significant ways for the public good, and women in organizations who have initiatives that support women and men with disabilities in tech careers. We'll hear some career stories about successes, and we'll hear about some challenges and some barriers still to be overcome and we'll hear about what's needed for a more inclusive tech sector. Some of our speakers are joining us remotely, and when the session ends today, we hope that the faces and the voices that you will have seen and heard will help us all to form a richer picture of who is a technologist and leader in tech. And I want to thank in advance our wonderful speakers who have come from near and far, who are here in person and on the line for joining us. And they hail from the private sector, large and small, from civil society, the UN, and academia. And with our ambassadors, we also have a very strong government representation for this session. My name is Ursula Weinhoven, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for this session. I'm the representative to the UN here in New York for the ITU, the UN Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Digital inclusion goes to the heart of the ITU's mission, which is to connect everyone everywhere, regardless of their means. And while we have extensive work to increase access to ICTs for persons with disabilities by raising awareness of their right to access, mainstreaming accessibility in the development of international ICT standards, and providing education and training on key accessibility issues, and supporting member states in a number of ways in their efforts to create more inclusive digital societies, I'm not going to talk about that work today, um, and you can certainly find more information um, under digital inclusion and accessibility on the ITU's website. Instead, um, our focus today is on our amazing speakers. So without further ado, I'm really delighted to introduce Her Excellency Ambassador Ms. Aya Int Ahmed Altani, Permanent Representative of Qatar to the United Nations. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Uh, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, um, of course, I'm very delighted to be here today and to co-sponsor this event together um, with the mission of Ecuador and, and the representation of ITU in New York. The state of Qatar, of course, is delighted uh, to be part of this initiative, uh, an event on changing the face of tech leadership and celebrating women with disabilities who are leading the way in technology industries. Um, together with the permanent mission of uh, Ecuador, 
the UN ITU, UN uh, DESA, and UN OICT, Virgin Media, uh, Project Hearing, and Equals a Global Partnership. Uh, technology is extremely uh, important in supporting people with disabilities, both in education and working place settings. Qatar is aggressively using ICT to support people with disabilities. ICTs can make a world of difference to those with disabilities, girls and boys, men and women. ICTs um, uh, foster greater equity, reduce barriers, empower and ensure integration into Qatari society. Our ultimate goal is that by being able to access a range of services and opportunities online, including e-government services and education tools, persons with disabilities are empowered. Moreover, we pay special attention to the specific needs of girls and women. For example, MEDA is a Qatari uh, assistive technology center, an initiative that seeks to co connect people with disabilities to the world of information and communication technology. Um, um, uh, about um, assistive technology in both Arabic and English. MEDA's website is the first of its kind in the Arab world, and MEDA is considered the world center of excellence in digital access in Arabic. Uh, more importantly, we work to enable equal basis for persons with disabilities, both women and men, to take part in cultural, social, and economic activities via ICT. We also support the provision of opportunities for women with disabilities to use their creative, artistic, and intellectual potential independently. Uh, women with disabilities have participated in developing strategies that guarantee the implementation of ap ap um, appropriate accessible technologies. I'm extremely proud to note that groundbreaking research is being conducted by Qatari women for instance, at the Qatari Biomedical Research Institute at Hamad bin Khalifa University. Uh, one of the professors, Dr. Sara Abdullah, is working on the use of uh, tracking, eye tracking technology as a diagnostic tool for the early identification of ASD. Uh, Professor Dina Althani, also a faculty member at Hamad bin Khalifa University and professor at the College of Science and Engineering at the university, is also working on the role of sensing technologies and virtual reality in supporting the teaching and learning of children with autism spectrum disorder. Also, um, uh, Maha Al Mansour, who is the executive director of the MEDA Center for Assistive Technology in Qatar. Um, 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 and also Noor al sulaiti Head of Speech and Language Therapy Unit at the Shafalah Center for Persons with Disabilities, a very well-established center in Qatar, is working on the role of technology in the therapeutic intervention of people with autism. I will stop here. I wanted to share some of the examples, and I hope we, and we look forward to a very enriching discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for your leadership in this in this area and sharing with us those um, really uh, inspiring and uh, actions. Um, I'm now, and I understand that you need to leave us at some point. So we thank you again for your um, kind participation. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce His Excellency Ambassador Mr. Luis Gallegos Chiroboga, Permanent Representative of Ecuador to the United Nations. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, uh, sitting next to Daniela and sitting next to Alia, uh, who I know and I know the, the advances of her country. I just mentioned to her a few minutes ago that during the negotiations of the convention, uh, I had the pleasure of working very closely with Kesa Altani, who was the Special Rapporteur for Disability during my tenure as president of the, uh, of the negotiation of the working, uh, that took place in the working group. And uh, uh, I will always refer to Article 9 on the issue of technology uh, accessibility because this was one of the issues that we negotiated. Um, dear moderator, Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to host it jointly with, with Qatar and with the ITU. Um, I, in full disclosure, I am the chair of the Board of Trustees of G3ICT. We began this uh, adventure in 2006 before the convention was approved, uh, specifically to try to get technology in, in, in Article 9 on accessibility. 
Uh, it has been a very, uh, a very important initiative because it's been very successful. Uh, I think that it's uh, completely a volunteer organization, of course, but it has managed to produce an index every year for ITU and for the Committee on Disability for uh, more than 140 countries on the issue of te technology, uh, the, the state's responsibility for compliance with Article 9. Um, I will read my statement and I will make a couple of, uh, of broader <coughs> remarks. It, it is a pleasure to give uh, some opening remarks on a very important event entitled Changing the Face of, Le of Tech Leadership, Celebrating Women with Disabilities Who Are Leading the Way in Tech, uh, where we aim to showcase existing initiatives aimed at supporting women with disabilities in their careers in tech and celebrate female technology entrepreneurs with disability. I would like to thank the International Telecommunications Union and UNDESA for organizing this gathering in order to highlight the participation of leadership with the women with disabilities in the sector. With ITU, I just, uh, I just mentioned the regional meeting on accessibility that took place in Quito uh, on the 20th of, uh, of, uh, of November. It was a very successful regional meeting on the issue of technology and accessibility. As you are well, are you well aware, women, in particular women with disabilities, under, are underrepresented in the tech sector and the leadership positions. Nevertheless, there are many women and disabilities entrepreneurs and employees at all levels who make great contribution in the area and who will not receive the recognition they deserve. Today, we will hear about their stories and legacies. As ambassador and permanent representative of Ecuador, I had the privilege of presiding over the elaboration of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities from 2002 to 2005. Furthermore, I have been able to collaborate with many initiatives with civil society and the private sector, where I have witnessed the work of many women with disabilities who are real role models. The convention has currently 181 ratifications, which is the, an impressive number of almost reaches the universal ratification, as an as extraordinary achievement, uh, which is an extraordinary achievement. It followed decades of work by the United Nations and civil society to change attitudes and approaches to persons with disabilities. It aimed at perceiving persons with disabilities not merely as objects of charity, medical treatment, or social protection, but to recognize them as subjects whose human rights needed, needed to be recognized, protected, and promoted. But more relevantly, persons who are capable of claiming their rights and making decisions for their lives as active members of society. Ecuador currently cha chairs the Conference of State Parties to the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities, we are, where we are working along with other state parties, the UN system, and non-governmental organizations toward a common goal, to fully implement the convention, to promote human rights, and to advance toward inclusive and sustainable development for persons with disabilities. This year, in 2019, one of the panels of the meeting of the COSP was exactly on ITC technology and disability. The Bureau of the Conference has already started planning the 13th session, which will take place from 10 to 12th of June 2020, with a very important political background, as next year marks the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, the 25th anniversary of the World Summit of Social Development, and the most relevant, Beijing Plus 25. The year 2020 will be, therefore, a pivotal year for accelerating realization of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls, including women and disabilities all over the world. We cannot leave women with disabilities behind. The empowerment of women with disabilities and their full participation in the spheres of society, including the tech sector, is fundamental for the achievement of equality, development, and inclusion. Persons with disabilities are estimated to represent 15% of the world's population. One in five women is likely to experience a disability during her lifetime. And 46% of persons uh, 60 years of age or over have a disability. Events such as this are crucial to share ideas, experience, and good practices that can benefit persons with disabilities, their families, and their communities. Girls and women of all ages and any form of disability are generally among the more vulnerable and marginalized of society. There is therefore the need to take into account that to address these concerns in an all policy making and programming. Special measures are needed in the tech sector and in leadership positions. Strengthening inclusion, full participation, solidarity, equality must be a priority, and it should be our firm commitment to contribute to build societies free of discrimination and without the barriers that limit the enjoyment of human rights, in particular persons with disabilities. Only together we will achieve their objectives and continue working to benefit one billion people with disabilities, rightfully claiming nothing about us without us. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Ambassador. What wonderful framing remarks for the discussion that we're going to um, have today. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership, and we also understand that you may need to leave us at some point to go to another event. So thank you again so much for joining us today. So now it's time to turn to the first of our speakers, and first is a dear partner of the ITU, Daniela Bass, Director, Division for Inclusive Social Development at uh, the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Um, Daniela, thank you so much, as always, for your, for your partnership. Um, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for ITU. Do you know who invented uh, the keyboard that nowadays everybody uses? And even in our mobile phones, we do have a keyboard, don't we? Well, it was a thanks to a person who was visually impaired and Braille had to be created, uh, also to have the ability to type. And then thanks to that uh, technological device, it has become a commodity that everybody uses for the well-being and the commodity of everybody. Do you know who created the famous luxurious jacuzzi? Well, it was actually someone from the region I come from, from Italy. And the name, actually, the name should be pronounced, pronounced jacuzzi. But it became jacuzzi, okay. <laughs> Now, uh, the Jacuzzi, Jacuzzi or Jacuzzi family moved from northeast of Italy to the state of California, and they were farmers. And their mother um, developed arthritis. And they were told that in order to cure the arthritis of their mother, she would have needed to be massaged with water. Now, they were farmers, and they used to irrigate fields with pipes. So they decided to add some pipes in the, in the tub bath. In, in, the, in the bath, in the tub, with some holes and, you know, to have some bubbles uh, for this poor woman to be treated with arthritis. Nowadays, jacuzzi or jacuzzi or jacuzzi is sold everywhere in the, in the world to have your beautiful massage of bubbles. So what I'm trying to say here is that technology, either because created by women who are in technology or by uh, consumers of technology uh, have had an amazing impact on what nowadays is a commodity for everyone. Therefore, I very much liked the title chosen today, celebrating women with disabilities who are leading the way in tech. Now, the woman who had, arthri who had arthritis and uh, stimulated the creation of this jacuzzi thing that is, uh, um, she, was, she led uh, the way to technology, right? So there are many ways of leading when it comes to technology. And then there are also amazing women like those mentioned by the ambassador of Qatar who are into technology. And, and so either thanks to technology or women who are engaged uh, in some form uh, uh, in leading the way for uh, a better life, then they can lead that way through technology, through technology. Because through technology, we can improve infrastructures. Through technology, we can do so much. So with the technology and through technology, the through opens so many other doors. Um, so I just want you to start with some specific examples, concrete examples of how uh, women with disabilities who are leading the way in technology in various ways, either because they produce or they consume technology, are really making sure that uh, all these uh, devices that are created um, are for the well-being of everyone. So it's not just referred to persons with disabilities who are consumers of technology. There is a still this kind of stereotype. Um, luckily, Ambassador Gallego uh, when started this adventure in, back in 2006 with this uh, group uh, that deals with the technology, uh, they started promoting the concept of technology, which is uh, not just as consumers, as producers, but it's really technology for everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so um, 
when it comes to, for instance, we call it domotic. I think it's also in English domotic. I mean, it means that uh, we equip our homes uh, with the different kinds of technologies. And we, we use them and we give them for granted. But when some of these technologies are also applied uh, um, to, uh, to make uh, our life within our home more accessible and inclusive and easy, um, for instance, when we have to roll up the curtains, uh, if we have an electric button and it, it rolls up the curtains automatically, that doesn't, you know, doesn't only help uh, women or men with uh, disabilities or older people or any, uh, you know, broken arm for uh, one month because we were skinned like meds. And, uh, so um, not only it helps the uh, persons who uh, have a temporary or a permanent disability, but actually it makes life easier for everyone. And again, many of these things have been created by women with disabilities. Uh, so thank you very much, ITU, for having invited us and, and uh, worked with us on, on this issue. Article 9 of CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I will not talk about that because um, our ambassador already uh, spoke very much in detail about that, as well as uh, the numbers of persons with the disabilities in the world were already mentioned, but we shouldn't think only about the um, numbers of per persons with disabilities in the world. The world is aging, so uh, that also requires um, um, benefiting of whatever technologies are invented by women with the disabilities who think about making life easier very often when they develop new products. Um, but this, this applies then actually to a much wider population than the one we usually think of when we refer to persons with disabilities. So besides that, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, we have also the 2030 Agenda uh, with its 17 goals uh, and, the, and the, the, the 17 goals lay out the concrete plan of action for people, for the planet, and for prosperity. We are already in the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is, 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 uh, is led by technology and finance. And therefore, um, um, if, if we look at the United Nations report on disability and development, we understand that we are really still very much behind when it comes to uh, the use of technologies to improve the life of everyone, particularly of persons with uh, disabilities. In this report, it is so clearly highlighted that um, there is a significant gap between persons with and without disabilities in the use of internet. I would, I would be tempted to talk about STEM, I will not, because otherwise we really have to touch so many different areas. I will focus on technology, not on math, or science, or engineering. Um, and among the 14 countries that we have analyzed in this report, uh, the UN Report on Disability and Development, only 19, 19, 19% of persons with uh, disabilities compared to 36% of persons without disabilities use internet. And we are in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so, the, you know, we, we really have to pay much more attention about innovation, technologies, and entrepreneurship. Women with disabilities and without disabilities together, but also together with men with and without disabilities, people. People should really um, join hands uh, and think about innovative ways uh, to make our world more sustainable thanks to technologies. And I go back, it's not just the computer or the, mi or, or the mobile phone. The wheelchair is a technological device. If we think of sport for all, there we also have technological devices, but just a simple, humble pair of glasses is high tech. And we give it for granted. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are aiming at here at the United Nations with the efforts of, of um, amazing people like, like the ambassador and others. We have been, no, but it is true, um, Mr. Ambassador. Um, we, we keep talking, but not just for the sake of talking. We would like to reach exactly this, wearing a pair of glasses. Nobody notices it anymore. Actually, it's fashionable like jacuzzi. That's what we are aiming at. 
even with this event of today. So access to technologies for women and girls with disabilities is crucial. We know that often women with and young, young women and girls, et cetera, with disabilities are left behind more than ever than others. Even among men with disabilities, they're, even, they're left behind, further behind even men with disabilities. So the governments, the private sector, and all stakeholders needed to work together to achieve the goal of real inclusion, real access. Women's empowerment is essential in, uh, in, uh, in achieving inclusive societies and therefore investing in technologies, in innovation and entrepreneurship needs to be prioritized. So that's why I said at the very beginning, women in technology, uh, women with disabilities in technology, women with the disabilities uh, and how they can lead the, the way through technology. Um, next year, during the Commission for Social Development, uh, thank you for mentioning it, Mr. Um, Ambassador Gallego, that we will be, be celebrating 25 years of uh, social development. We want to make sure that it, what we have achieved so far is sustainable. Uh, social development was, was um, discussed in Copenhagen 19, in 1995. Now we have an agenda, agenda that talks about sustainability. So we have to celebrate what has been achieved in, during the last 25 years, also from the angle of technology. But now we have to make sure that what has been achieved has to be sustainable. We have an agenda. And what hasn't been planned and thought yet has to be discussed and, and carried on. One thing, the, you know that the, the United Nations was created, established after the Second World War after the Second World War to bring peace and make sure that there aren't any more major conflicts. We know th that technology can play a role in this, either to bring peace or not. The role of women and women with disabilities when they are in conflict situations is key. So let's celebrate the establishment of the United Nations next year, but also the very same year, the Social Commission was established that was renamed in 1995 Commission for Social Development because there was the Copenhagen Summit. So this commission, the Commission for Social Development at that time, Social Commission, was established 75 years ago to bring a social justice and technology, if used properly, can promote social justice and inclusion of all. So please do attend the Commission for Social Development next, next February, member states, and all other stakeholders we work with bring this voice, the voice of technology uh, to, to, to the Commission and the voice of, voice of persons with disabilities, of, of older people, of youth, uh, uh, and, and all of those who can benefit of technology in its various forms to the Commission next year that will focus on affordable housing and homelessness. What is the role of technology in making sure that people do not suffer from from being homeless. So it's just a challenge I throw there. Sorry, I spoke too much, I know, uh, but it's a fascinating field. And regrettably, I have another meeting, budget, so I have to go there. But I, I really wanted to share with you all my passion and how much I believe in this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniela, for your um, powerful words and, and, and passion and making the really good points as well about uh, women with disabilities in tech as innovators and truly leading the way. And that's indeed a critical theme and motivation behind today's event. So uh, now we're going to turn to our first speaker who's participating remotely. Um, Margot, are you there? Um, this is Margot um, Joff, Director, Accessibility Marketing at Verizon Media, and also founder of Kaleidoscope Society for Women with ADHD. Um, Margot, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, we may ask our technicians, though, to turn up your volume a bit, because it's a little light, but uh, we, we also have your slides on screen, Margot. Thank you so much for joining us. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you to the ITU and UN DESA for this invitation. I'm honored to be part of the United Nations celebration of the International Day of People with Disabilities and to promote the accomplishments of women with disabilities in the technology sector. At Verizon Media, we're proud to support the United Nations and the work that they do to support women 
to support people with disabilities and to support the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. As we've heard today, technology plays an integral role in accomplishing many of the SDGs regarding economic prosperity, education, employment, and gender equality. As we work towards sustainable development, we should keep in mind that people with disabilities, particularly women, should be recognized not only as beneficiaries, but more importantly, agents of change. Because people with disabilities face so many challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, they have unique perspectives and problem-solving abilities and can make significant contributions to solving critical challenges we face in the world today. And therefore, I believe women with disabilities should be included in decision-making roles at all levels and across all sectors. As we focus on the SDGs, not only should we strive to leave no one behind, but we should recognize that women with disabilities are well positioned to lead the way forward. In the tech sector, there are many, many examples of outstanding women leaders who happen to have disabilities. For example, Haben Gurma, the first deaf man to earn a degree from Harvard Law School, is now working as an advocate in the tech industry. K.R. Liu, a technology executive with severe hearing loss who advises leading tech companies such as Amazon, Google, and many others on inclusive design and hearing technology innovations. Donna Starker, a chief engineering leader at Microsoft with dyslexia, who is advocating for others with learning disabilities in the workplace. And Sam Latif, accessibility leader at Procter & Gamble with retinitis pigmentosa, who is driving innovation and disability inclusion across their product line. And these are just a few of the many, many talented women with disabilities leading the way in technology. Many disabilities are visible, but most are not. I myself have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and I am proud to identify as part of the neurodivergent community. Through my own experience with ADHD and creating an online support community called Kaleidoscope Society, I've seen the lack of support for women with cognitive impairments and other disabilities around the world. I've become an advocate for these women, and I've seen how much they have to contribute. Now working in the technology industry, I've seen women, specifically women with disabilities, are severely underrepresented in tech leadership. In the United States, the overwhelming majority of employees with disabilities hide their conditions, living in fear of discrimination and fear of losing their jobs. This is a key issue together we must address. At Verizon Media, we've built a global, support, global network of support for employees with cognitive disabilities and mental health conditions through our Neurodiversity Employee Resource Group. We recognize that neurological differences drive innovation and make our company stronger. I'm proud to be part of Verizon Media's accessibility team committed to full digital inclusion for people with, disabil people with disabilities. We are working to achieve digital inclusion in several ways. First, by making our products and services such as Yahoo, AOL, and HuffPost accessible to people with disabilities which includes captioning our video content, designing and developing apps to support screen readers, and integrating many other accessibility features. We believe every user should have a premium experience using our technology, including those with disabilities. Secondly, as a global media leader, we recognize the impact and power that images have on our world. And unfortunately, people with disabilities, especially women with disabilities, have been underrepresented and misrepresented in the media. So we've partnered with Getty Images and the National Disability Leadership Alliance to improve the representation of disability in the media through the disability collection. And finally, Verizon as a whole has committed to creating a robust digital inclusion program to address barriers and enable connectivity to those who need it most so that everyone can benefit from Verizon's technology. The tech industry has made great strides but we still have a long way to go to achieve full inclusion. We are building the technology that is shaping the future of education, employment, and the world. We have the responsibility and the opportunity to make a significant difference. So in conclusion, three things I encourage us all to work on are, number one, we need to continue to make accessible we need to continue to make technology accessible to everyone. Number two, 
we need to work to dispel the stigma surrounding disabilities that in some cases can be more debilitating than the disabilities themselves. And three, we need to increase employment and advancement of people with disabilities, especially women. If given the chance, women with disabilities can make even greater contributions to the tech industry and society as a whole. I'd like to thank the United Nations for organizing this event and shining a light on women with disabilities working the technology industry. Together, we can empower even more women with disabilities to participate, to lead, and to use their talents for the good of society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margot. That was fantastic. And thanks for all that you do. And thanks also in your remarks for celebrating other women in tech um, with disabilities and your action oriented uh, call at the end. Very, very good. Um, now we're going to turn back to New York where we have Gamza Sofuglu, Senior Product Manager, Turkcell. And Gamza came from Turkey to be with us and to share her work and perspective. And so we're so, um, we're so grateful to her. Um, and also want to thank GSMA um, for making the connection to, to Gamza. Um, so Gamza, please go ahead. I know you've got so much um, to tell us, including about your, your own journey as a woman in tech with disabilities, but also about the awesome product areas that you lead, which are really making a difference for um, women and men. Thank you. Should I open? Yes. It's OK. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone, I am Gandu Sofuoğlu from Turkcell, uh, which is the biggest GSM operator and the first digital operator in Turkey. And I am responsible for the application and accessibility project for disabled people. Uh, as Turkcell, we uh, divided our project for disabled people into two categories. The first one is making uh, accessible all our products, services, and solutions. Because, uh, you know, uh, disabled people are not just the object of social responsibility project. They are customer as well, and we have to make all our uh, products and services accessible, and we are working on this. Uh, and the other uh, part of our uh, project is making accessible um, many aspects of social life. And for this aim, we uh, provide three different uh, applications. The first one uh, is my dream companion for blind people. Uh, our users can access thousands of daily news columns, audiobooks, magazines, trainings, and so on. And also, we provide indoor navigation technology for uh, uh, public areas like shopping mall, university, museum, and so on. And blind people can get step-by-step -step indoor navigation in these areas. Uh, and finally, we provide audio description technology for movies. Uh, our application can recognize the parts in the film, and when the dialogue stops, detailed description uh, automatically starts uh, by, with synchronizing by the film. And so blind people are able to watch movies without missing any visual details in all theaters in Turkey. Uh, and our second application uh, is for children with autism and their uh, teachers and their parents. Uh, we, provide, um, we provide more than 100 educational games to support uh, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral improvement of uh, children with autism. And uh, parents and teachers can follow uh, their uh, children's improvement on the application. Uh, and our third application is for deaf people. We provide uh, instant translator technology, and uh, this technology can uh, translate written and spoken words and sentences in sign language. And also we provide some dictionaries and education for, for the people who uh, want to learn how to speak sign language. Um, we uh, and all these applications, by the way, all these applications are totally free for everyone, not just Tur Turkcell subscribers, everyone in Turkey. Uh, most people ask uh, us why 
you focus this area because we believe that disability is not a uh, physical impairment. Actually, it's the it's direct outcome of social barriers. And if we can remove these social barriers by power of technology, then disability would be a very ordinary uh, difference rather than a, a disadvantage, disadvantage uh, property, actually. That's why we uh, give importance to this uh, project so much. And um, I'm so, I feel myself so happy and so lucky to be in this position as a blind woman um, because, uh, you know, the person who knows real and main needs best uh, for, blind pe for disabled people is a disabled person, actually. And um, if this person is woman as well, it's much more better because we know that disabled women face discrimination twice, uh, their disabilities and their genders, and we should also uh, work on decreasing uh, inequality between disabled people and non-disabled people, between disabled women and non-disabled women, and between disabled women and disabled men. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gamza, and they're really exciting examples, I think, of the difference that technology can make, and thanks so much for all the great work you do, making um, so much more in life accessible for, for everybody. Very, very exciting work. Um, so now, technology willing, um, let's go to Kenya um, to hear from Judy Okite. Um, Judy is a woman in tech leader and founder of Association for Accessibility and Equality. Um, and Judy, you've kindly agreed to share with us your, your story, um, namely as a woman leader in tech and founder yourself, sharing your journey, um, successes, challenges, and perspective on what's needed to better support women with disabilities in tech. And we're especially appreciative because it's so late in your night um, so, Judy, if you're with us, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Isla. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. My name is Judy Okite. I am founder of Association for Accessibility and Equality, where we audit, we advocate, train for accessibility, both online and offline. I come from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm honored to be part of this panel today to talk about women with disability in ICT. If I would tell about my story, uh, we may need another sitting because it's going, it's long. But in short, I got into ICT not by choice, but because of an eventuality. I got sick, I got into a coma, I suffered a stroke, and in the process, because of lack of proper medical intervention, I suffered paralysis. It's been 28 years, and due to therapies and rehabilitation, I'm able to move around using a walker, and sometimes, based on distance, I may need to use a wheelchair. This happened at a very crucial time of my life when I was to choose a career path. My dream was to be a pilot but I chose ICT. It was called a man's world at the time, and I seemed to have a tendency to get out of the norm. But more so, I chose it because it was less pressure on my new physical acquired status. I started at the basics of what a computer is, of what is a keyboard, of what is Microsoft Word. My interest grew, and I wanted to know how a computer talks to another computer. Then I got into a networking class. Then the more difficult at the time, into Unix and into Linux. And more and more, I fell in love with ICT. I spent a lot of time self-learning. There had to be a lot of sacrifices for my parents, for my family, for my friends, to ensure that I got to school. Because I could only use private transportation, leave alone the challenge of a physical space that was not accessible. 
So I had to be literally carried into class. That brought the challenge of missing a lot of classes because either there was nobody available at the time to take me to school or there was nobody available to carry me to class. Just to mention a few challenges. However, it was very exciting when these courses were introduced online. And so the cost that we had to bear was for the very expensive internet connection at the time. I am so grateful this far, and I have never stopped learning because the digital space keeps changing every day. Out of the acquired knowledge, I teach online ICT policy and strategic planning with Diplo Foundation, internet governance courses, and I also teach offline computer courses and network administration. I am actively involved in the ICT policy space in Kenya, very active in the internet governance forums, nationally, regionally, continentally, and even globally, pushing the agenda of persons with disability into the digital space. I'm also active in a few of the tech spaces, and for example, the internet society. As a hobby, I'm often invited to schools to, to talk to girls about the opportunities in technology and sometimes volunteer to teach them computer basics, for example, how to install a software. When it comes to women with disability in technology, in one of the researches that we have done with the association, we have found that many women with disability may not be in the technology possibly because we are not only coming from a background where educating the girl child was not a priority, but a girl child with a disability is much more of a lesser priority. And for most of those that have the opportunity to be educated, then they are not in a career that they chose, but one that was chosen for them, either by their guardians, by their parents, or even the institution that they went to. For example, in Kenya, there are very few higher learning institutions that cater for persons with disabilities and have very particular courses that they believe would fit for a person with disability. So you will find many persons with disability are either in the teaching career or in administration. There are many things that we ought to do, but I will mention a few. One, we have a very wholesome digital literacy program. It's time to tailor make it to fit for a person with disability, to fit for the woman with a disability. We need to do research. We need to break down the wholesome number of persons with disability and find out how many women are we talking about. What is their age group? What is their education level, if at all? Let's introduce the girl child with a disability into technology from the youngest age. All the programs that we've had for the girl child, let's tailor make it for the girl child with a disability. Let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's get our hands into the mud because disability is diverse so that we do not find ourselves again where we are. Let's open up more opportunities for women with disabilities in the tech space, not necessarily locking them out because of their credentials, but let's begin working with them from their point of interest. They are interested in technology. They could be in a career that was chosen for them, and so this might disqualify them for a tech study, but let's remember that they are educated. And lastly, let's begin implementing the policy. Online platform accessibility, we need to press for this. Let's do evaluation, let's do monitoring, what's happening, what needs to change, and how. You will find that in the developing countries, the transportation system does not work for persons with disability. 
The physical space does not work for a person with disability. Let's open up the digital space. Let's create accessible online platforms. Let's put our goods and services there, and let's see if the women with disability will not transform the economy. I know I'm past my time, but in closing, digital knowledge in itself presents independence, and that's a dream for every woman with a disability. We have 10 years. Together, let's make that dream come true. Thank you very much. Judy, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing um, your journey and your impassioned call for action and um, your your passion for tech as well really, really came through. We appreciate you staying up so late at night too where you are to, to, join, to join us and we really, really appreciate it. Um, now we're going to hear from another uh, awesome woman in tech, this time in the UK. Um, Dr. Kathy Holloway, she's also staying up late at night to be able to join us today. Um, she's Associate Professor, Unclick and Academic Director for GDI Hub, and she's going to tell us about that. Um, thank you so much, um, so much, uh, Kathy. Capacity building is so critical to participation and leadership, the theme of the International Day yesterday and also of this session. And you have a really exciting program that we're really keen to hear about. So, so Kathy, please go ahead. So I, I, thank you very much, and uh, thanks, um, thanks for inviting me. It's an honour. Um, can I just double check how long I have? Six minutes, was it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go through the 16 slides. It's going to be quite impressive, but I'm going to go through them very quickly. So the first slide is that the Global Disability Innovation Hub. Um, we are building a movement to accelerate disability innovation for a fairer world. And we do that through policy and participation, innovation and entrepreneurship, and research and teaching. And obviously, technology cuts across all of those. One of the words I'd single out there is accelerate disability innovation. So we are very aware that we are only part of a much bigger network of the global drivers of this force. And our job is just where we can help to accelerate. We do. Um, and we do that in partnerships. So the second slide. Um, our vision comes from the Paralympic Games of 2012. So for those of you who may have been in London or heard about London, um, we created the Paralympic Games by, through partnerships which enabled people and communities to lead new thinking about disability across the world, especially with disabilities ex um, exclusion is compounded by the destructive impacts of poverty. So basically we took what we thought from the Paralympic Games, if you look at the next slide, um, it was the most successful Paralympic Games ever and the most accessible Olympic Games ever. And that was on the back of the, when we first got the Games from, um, when we won them off of Paris, it should have been Paris's Games maybe. One of the things that happened is we asked people how likely they would be to go to the Paralympics. And basically there was nobody. Nobody wanted to go to the Paralympics. And it took a huge amount of work and energy to get people to understand how brilliant equally brilliant Paralympic athletes are to Olympic athletes. And, and that, that, um, that work that was done was phenomenal in London. And we wanted to make sure that wasn't lost. And that is why we set up the Global Disability Innovation Hub. So on the next slide, you'll see the, the founding partner logos. It was launched by the Mayor of London on the eve of the Rio 2012 Games. We have a multidisciplinary um, founding partner. So we have Leonard Cheshire, who are, uh, you know, very well known in the disability space. And then maybe someone like the University of the Arts London or University College London, where I work, who are less well known. But everybody in, that, in, in those founding partners were working um, on assistive technologies, on innovations that would help disrupt thinking in disability. So sometimes that's through policy. Sometimes it's through attitudinal change. Sometimes it's a new bit of kit. But we have this vision to, to work together. So the next slide, you'll see that um, I lead the Academic Research Centre, um, and that is the one that has a number of PhD students, who, some of whom are disabled, but also have a disability, depending on which nomenclature you want. Um, but the Disability Design and Innovation MSc was the first one that tried to bring this new thinking of innovation across the disciplines, um, and realising that innovation in, in their policy or in, in technology was equally important. Um, in the next slide, you'll also see that we have a community interest company. And that community interest company, the reason I'm in Kenya today, is that we launched um, our first accelerated cohort with our Kenyan partners here 
um, yesterday. And we are working with a number of disabled people here, some female. Um, but we're, we're trying to push those boundaries. Um, and actually, I think that one of the key things, and I will go through the rest of the slides, but the main thing I want to get across in case we run out of time is that we know the intersectionality of the problems um, within and around disability. But as the previous speaker said, they're compounded by the fact that the physical space is not accessible. Um, and so digital space provides an accessibility gateway into jobs, into employment, when we can't yet get the physical space um, up to scratch. And I think that if we can get women into this space, we can change a lot to do, not just the technologies that will be produced, which will be better, um, but also we can change the way people think about women in society. Um, they're not just the people that stay at home, they are the people that are, are breadwinners and the equal breadwinners with, with other people in the family. So our MSD in Disability Design Innovation has attracted far more females than males, um, and a lot of the, the students have um, a disability. And actually, it's been a very interesting task to try and make the course accessible. And one of the places where we've had to work really hard is in coursework and the demands that coursework places on students. So that if you have a disability, obviously, then there are additional demands on your life. And then stu the students that don't have a disability sometimes don't realize those demands. So there's been a lot of um, education within group work to try and figure out how to make the course as, as accessible as, as possible. So we're creating a new breed of graduates. You can go to the next slide, slide eight, um, to apply design thinking to the complex problem of disability. It's awarded by UCL. It's uniquely multidisciplinary. We bring in global experts. It's the world's first. It's an emerging field of study. It's very, very background and encouraged. So we have everybody from an artist, an architect, to um, a physiotherapist on the course to someone with a public health background. Um, the next slide shows that it's taught in our new, uh, um, our new space, which is here east, which is nicely accessible, which makes life good. And in the next slide, you'll see that we have attracted a number of studentships. So we have a lot of studentships uh, through the Snowden Trust for students with disability. One of the things I, I'd like to mention is it's really difficult to get funding to bring students from lower to middle income countries into the UK. And so one of the things I'd be really keen on hearing from, from the group there is how do we either export this thinking to be able to provide this, this master's jointly with, with universities globally um, so that people don't have to travel? Or how can we secure funding for students who are excellent and female, maybe, uh, but also um, live with a disability that can come to London, learn, and then bring that knowledge back to their country to grow the movement um, in their country. And on the next um, slide, you'll see there's a whole pipeline of activities. So we run summer schools. I've run a, a wheelchair hacking summer school for a number of years with the Dyson Foundation. We do a lot of work where all of our work is 50-50, 50% uh, males, 50% females on all of our courses. We do a lot of public visit, uh, visibility work some profiles across UCL and partners to drive interest and awareness of the field. So we're now getting disability mainstreamed into a lot of other courses as well as, as because we've, we've kind of been shouting about it. Um, the staff and board, we have a, 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 a board is 75% made up of um, disabled people and is chaired by Lord Chris Holmes, who's a Paralympic athlete in his time. Um, and we, we generally just try to break down barriers, and, and we do that through partnerships, as I said. There's a list of modules, but you can look at those on the website. But I think the most important thing is to realize that it's, it's taught across three universities. We've brought the expertise from arts and science and technologies into to one space, um, and, we, and we work together on that. And the career options on the next slide... Um, inclusive design and innovation, you know, we, we have a very good working relationship with Microsoft, for example. They come in and help deliver some master classes for us and, and, some, and some guest speech speakers. So they're, they're the mainstreaming of accessibility within places like Microsoft and Google and Facebook, there, there are jobs in there. But there's also startups, um, work within international development, work within disability rights. We have Disability Rights UK just across the road. We have Scope, which is a big UK charity on disability just across the road. So there's an awful lot of different areas where the students can get employment and they're, they're exposed to those employment opportunities as the course goes on. So on the penultimate slide, you'll see that um, technology is potential to change lives. I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys uh, that. Um, but also the demand for assistive technology is accelerating. There's also a demand for accessible technology that is accelerating. And, and we are championing the fact that if we create accessible technology, it's better for everybody. Everybody knows that. 
when transport systems are accessible, they're better for everybody. When, when, when software is made accessible, it's better for everybody. The biggest problem is getting that business case because everybody only sees the cost. They don't see the benefit. And I, I, the reason I stay up late and talk to, to people like yourselves is because I really care that we collate that evidence into a body that is so overwhelming that people can't just keep arguing against it. And I believe that people like Microsoft have done a good job of this by getting a chief accessibility officer. Having accessibility put at that, the same level as everything else it is, I think, really key. And that's what we try to drive through our MSC, but also through all the work at GDI Hub. We try to drive that, that disability and inclusion agenda across UCL and across our partners so they can't it can't be an add-on. It's not we're going to build a new building and then we're going to make it accessible. We're going to build a new software and then we're going to make it accessible. That's just It's just a thing that should be done from the start. So I've, you can check out the website. I'm sure my details can be shared with anyone if you've got questions. I'm sorry if I've gone over, but I thank you very much for the opportunity to share our thinking. Kathy, that was fabulous. Thanks so much for staying late to up late to, to share that. Really exciting program there and looks like some wonderful opportunities not only to participate but to support and, and to partner. So thank you so, so much. Um, we now are turning to Mariella Paulino. She's a disability advocate and techie and founder of Project Hearing. Uh, and she's on the line um, from DC, I think, um, to share her experience and work. Uh, thank you so much, Mariella. Please go, do go ahead. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Thank you, Mariella. All right. Awesome. So, hi, everyone. I am so sorry for not being there today. I was so, so excited, but I missed my train, and now I'm stuck in D.C. until 6 p.m. But I hope that my enthusiasm shines through the phone. So um, basically, I work for the City University of New York, um, CUNY. CUNY is the largest urban university um, in the United States, and I work there as a program manager for one of the most aggressive tech initiatives um, called CUNY TechWorks. Write it down. Basically, CUNY offers three tracks in software engineering, user experience design, and IT management. And so my role there is to be a program manager and make sure that the program is running. If you're interested in tech, check out the program. But that's not really what I want to talk to you guys today. Um, I began my career as an intern for the Department of Defense and quickly moved up the ranks. I decided to leave the Department of Defense, however, because I had the opportunity to do an incredible um, fellowship program with um, coding, called, with a program called Code for Progress. And um, there, I basically learned how to code. And one of the things that happened while I was in that program is that I was driving and I got pulled over by a police officer for speeding. Now, I have a hearing disability, and I use something that's called a cochlear implant, which is a device that allows me to hear. And so what had ended up happening is that the police officer pulls me over and he's speaking over the loudspeaker. But because of my hearing disability, it sounded like, whoa, 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 whoa. So I really couldn't understand what he was saying. He came out of his vehicle and he had his hand on his holster, the thing that um, holds the gun. And as he was walking towards me, I'm, I'm like, oh my goodness, like, I really don't want to die today. He comes over to my window and I tell him, officer, I'm really sorry. I couldn't understand what you were saying. I have a hearing disability. And when I said that, the officer kind of like releases the tension. And he tells me, I was giving you commands to turn off your vehicle, but you were not being compliant. And I again said, officer, again, I'm really sorry. I didn't hear you. I didn't understand what you were saying. Eventually, the officer let me go with a warning. Um, but before he let me go, he said something that completely changed my life. He said, you have to figure out something about this disability thing because that could have escalated. And I was just like, well, what do you suggest that I do? And he said, that's not my problem. You figure it out. And I was just like, okay. 
So what I decided to do is that I decided to go do my master's in communication at Georgetown University. And specifically, what I wanted to study was how people with disabilities, um, with hearing disabilities, interact with the police. What I found in my research was that a police officer will scan the back of your car for six seconds, six seconds, and they will look to see if you're a member of the National Rifle Association, if you're a teacher, a doctor, six seconds. And I just thought, why don't I just create stickers in the back of my car that say, death driver? And I started selling those stickers and people started buying those stickers. And that's where Project Hearing was born, from stickers. Since then, this was back in 2014, since then, um, Project Hearing has grown. Most recently, we had a Beltathon on October 5th of this year. And the Beltathon was an event for people with disabilities across the spectrum of disabilities to talk about challenges that they're having and work with a team of people to solve those challenges together. So engineers, doctors, user experience designers. Um, And one of the projects that I am working on right now for the future is really consolidating a list of all the tools that I use in my everyday life as a person with a hearing disability. You can check that out by going on Project Hearing across any of the social media channels, such as Instagram and Facebook. But one of the things that I really want to talk about today, because of these three ideas, the stickers, the hackathon, and the book that I'm writing, is that, one, you have to trust your ideas and stop asking for permission. So basically, if there is something that you really believe in and something that you want to change, you have the power to do that. You have agency and you have control over yourself. So trust your ideas. They are powerful and they matter. And again, that second point, stop asking for permission. Stop waiting for someone else to tell you this is a good idea. If you believe you have a good idea, just go ahead and execute. And the very last point that I want to make is that all of us, are responsible for creating the world that we need and for creating the tools that we need. One of the things that my mom always told me um, is that it's your disability and you have to figure out how to move around the world with your disability. And that's a challenge that I, um, that I want to bring to everyone. If you are a person with a disability and there's something that you're struggling with, and you have an idea for how to fix that problem, just create that solution, create that book, create that technology, create that tool, because once you solve it, you will not just solve the problem for yourself. You could potentially change the lives of a lot of other people. And that is basically um, what Project Healing is about. It's just a platform to empower people with hearing disabilities to learn about technology, to learn about tools, and to empower individuals to really take ownership of their disability and take control of their own lives. That's all I got. Thank you so much, Mariella. That was fantastic, and um, what an amazing story. And and proof yet again, like Daniela said earlier, about the strong link between women and tech and, and innovation and better world for, for all of us. So thank you so much, Mariella. Um, so now we're going to um, come back here to, to New York, where we are um, going to hear from our uh, fellow UN friends from the office of, of ICT here in the UN Secretariat. We have Suzanne Shanahan. She's the chief of the Enterprise Application Center Americas for UNOICT. Thanks so much, Suzanne. I know you've been doing some really important work that helps women and men with disabilities to access and use, use tech, and uh, we're excited to, to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, And thank you to ITU and DESA for the opportunity to speak today on a matter that's uh, very close to my heart. Um, I'm truly humbled by the speakers um, around the table and who I'm hearing over telephone. Um, 
In my role as accessibility focal point for the Office of Information and Communications Technology, we're looking for ways to leverage technology to improve accessibility for the disabled to our products, to our premises, and to our services across the United Nations in support of the disability inclusion strategy of the Secretary General. As a first step, access has been our priority. Access to our information, our headquarters, our facilities, and our applications. As a concrete example, the public websites of the United Nations have become our gateway to the people that we serve around the world. The UN.org homepage received 150 million unique visits last year. Our documents have been downloaded over 36 million times from our official document website. If these websites are not accessible, in, 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 for example, if they're not supporting assistive technologies, keyboard navigation, and other hosts of technological means to access them, then we are not effectively communicating what we do, our purpose, and our impact to the full complement of our global constituencies. OICT is working together with the Department of Global Communications to ensure that all our websites are compliant with international standards for accessibility. And we have made really great strides over the last two years. Um, in the next month, a uh, new administrative instruction will be issued that states that all UN Secretariat public information websites must be compliant with international accessibility standards. We're using a variety of technologies to make this cost effective and easy to manage through um, coding at the website level and also using software as a service um, overlays to make the websites accessible. We're also trying to make our premises and events more accessible. The building that we're sitting in today receives over 1 million visitors a year and we host about 11,000 member states meetings. It's a beautiful building, but it still posts a host of challenges to those with disabilities. For example, if you have visual impairments, finding the right conference room, finding the cafeteria, um, bathrooms, facilities, fire exits require that you ask someone for assistance. If you're hearing impaired, being able to follow and participate in meetings, proceedings themselves is difficult. Currently, our meetings require the use of sign language interpretation or closed captioning services that we're using today. You can see it on the screen, but they are not available in all rooms and they are not available for all events. To challenge this, we are exploring a host of innovative technologies. We're piloting speech to text technologies that use artificial intelligence and machine translation to enhance the ways we can transcribe and project speech as text for our events and meetings, both in real time and as recorded audio and video. I'm actually very happy to meet Hamza and I will be following up with her to hear some of the work that she's doing in Turkey in this regard. We're also testing wayfinding technologies to support those with visibility uh, impairments to better navigate our buildings. As also uh, mentioned by Hamza, these applications work with your mobile phone and they give you step-by-step -step instructions inside the building, the same way the GPS works outside of a building to walk you from one location to another. I think as uh, several of the other panelists mentioned, these solutions help not just people who are disabled, but everyone. Every visitor who comes to this building for the first time faces challenges getting from point A to point B. These exciting technologies only take us so far. They improve access. They help us ensure that people with disabilities get a seat at the table, so to speak. But our real goal needs to be inclusion. And inclusion comes through contact, everyday interaction, and through authentic working relationships and personal relationships. And it's only through these types of interactions and relationships that we can become aware of and overcome our own unconscious biases as individuals, as an organization, as a society. The Secretariat is committed to diversity and inclusion in its workplace. We have strategies and we have procedures and we have policies to help us achieve this. Often this starts with recruiting. Recruiting women into tech has been challenging, not only in the UN, but across the tech sector. The actual graduating rates for women in computer and information scientists are declining. In the US, for example, we are down from 
in 1985 to 19% in 2017. And this is at a time when graduation rates in law, medicine, and business are increasing. As a result, women in the, work in the tech workforce are declining while the pipeline of talent continues to shrink. I'm facing these challenges every day as a hiring manager in IT in the UN with a very aggressive gender parity strategy. The statistics for venture capital investment in female founded companies is equally depressing. With Fortune magazine reporting in the US that only 2% of overall invested dollars in 2017 went to female founded companies. I can only imagine that disabled women entrepreneurs in tech are not having an easy time of it. However, it is exactly in the tech sector that we have enormous potential and opportunities for economic development for women worldwide, and this market continues to grow year after year. On a personal level, as a woman in technology for over 25 years, I deeply believe that diversity of thought, specifically in engineering, yields the best outcomes. This is because the problems we perceive and those we choose to solve are highly subjective. It is proven that engineering teams with greater diversity in gender, cultural background, and physical and mental abilities see a broader scope of problems to solve and have a richer and deeper set of experiences to design their solutions. As mentioned by Ambassador Gallego, the global community of disabled people is estimated at about one billion people. This is a huge market both as a community the UN needs to serve, but also as a consumer community. And to meet the demand for our more inclusive products and services, we require a more diverse workforce, including here at the UN. For this reason, together with the Office of Human Resources, OICT has prioritized making the recruitment process more accessible to the disabled through technology. At present, the entire process of applying to a job in the Secretariat is conducted online. Looking for a job opening, submitting your resume, and taking tests and assessments are done using a variety of um, applications and websites. The UN uh, Careers Portal um, received about 7 million unique visits last year. It is an important property to attract talent into our house. Um, at the moment, and starting about two years ago, we have put in place accessibility features onto all of the websites and applications that touch the recruitment process to ensure that they meet international accessibility standards. Since these features have been made available, they have been accessed over a quarter of a million times. In addition, the interview process that we conduct is increasingly um, done over phone or by video to remove the physical barrier of coming on premise to interview for a position. We will continue to work to make the UN a more inclusive workspace. In the words of our ASG for Human Resources yesterday in her closing remarks at the International Day for Persons of Disabilities, we want to be held accountable, we want to learn, and we want the UN to be an employer of choice for all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Also, it's uh, encouraging to hear about the steps and actions that are being taken, taken here and around the world um, by, the, by the UN. Um, and, and clearly, as we've heard from so many of the amazing um, speakers today, the UN would have so much to gain as well if we were able to, to hire many more women in tech leading the way. Uh, so with that, um, it's now time to open the floor. If there's any questions or comments, I see a hand over here already. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. And I should just add, we'll, we'll take a, a round and then we'll come back to the, to the panel for their, their final word and, and responses to the questions. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Gail Davis Carter, and I am also um, a UN partner. I'm also part of a UN NGO with ECOSOC and uh, DGC, I think it is now, or UNDPI. Um, so we have projects in every one of the goals, and one of those goals is dealing with disability, okay? And it was, I was very taken back by the young lady who talked about being stopped by a police officer. I, she taught me something, I, and I think this would be helpful to everyone. I had an Uber where there was a young lady who was, had a hearing impairment. And impairment, And I was very concerned that she didn't have the equipment that she needed in the Uber if we had gotten hit. 
by a car. And ironically, we were almost hit by a car and the police were signaling her because she was just moving. And I think it's important that not only do we have to provide the disability community, but I would like to get to a place one day, and I know this might sound airy-fairy, but we don't have to use the word disability. That is just a place where people need certain services that others don't, because we all have our stuff in some way. But I learned that from that lesson. Um, you know, your concern, my concern for her, that she, and when I talked to her, she didn't have the money to purchase anything that would help her in the car. So we consequently were stopped by the police department, and she consequently was given a, a ticket, even though I argued for her that that wasn't the case. Uh, you know, she was, he didn't believe that she was hearing impaired. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. Any other questions or, or comments here? No? In, in that case, I think what we might do, starting with those who are on the phone, um, if you'd just like to share like a parting statement, like a parting comment, the most important takeaway that you would like the folks here and those who watch this afterwards, where it will be on webtv.un.org, something you would like people to take away. And you may, for instance, want to reiterate your call to action or make some other statement. So um, who would like to go first if we start with those who are joining us remotely? I can go first. This is Mariella. Um, go ahead, But Mariella. again, I think I'll... All right. So one of the things that I said um, earlier is that if you are a person with a disability or an ally and there's a challenge that you see if there is a problem that you see and you know that there is a solution for that problem, all of us have the power to create something. So if there is a challenge that you see and you have a solution, just go ahead and create that solution. Find people to help you with it. Find allies. Find um, the technology. Find the tool. Just put something out there because an idea is just an idea, but an idea can be something so much bigger than itself if you just execute it. So that would be my parting words. Beautiful parting words. Thank you, Mariella. Um, someone else on, online like to make a, a, a final takeaway point? We, we can come back to back to you, perhaps if we ask um, those who are in the room. Gamza, yeah, do you want to reiterate anything or make a final takeaway point that you want to leave us with? Um, actually, uh, I said everything <laughs> in my presentation, but maybe uh, I should uh, emphasize the most important part of my uh, speech. Um, uh, we can uh, remove social barriers with technology, with uh, reducing prejudice towards disabled people. And uh, as disabled people, we um, should focus on uh, removing the, these barriers. Um, and we should be active in uh, the project for disabled people. Um, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Um, Suzanne, do you want to uh, give us a final takeaway point? Um, sure. I think that something that struck me yesterday um, in the event when we had a number of, of speakers um, is that the role models and leaders that we see around us and how they're represented in the media, on television, in print, um, have a huge impact on the career paths that we choose, the potential in ourselves that we want to pursue. Um, I, when I think about the young girls out in the world that I'm praying are going to move into tech, if they don't see themselves represented in those leadership positions, it may not even occur to them that this is this is something that they want to pursue. Your opening statement referred to, you know, the guy in the hoodie. I have guys in hoodies that work for me, and they're they're great. Um, I also would like to see, you know, more women working in tech. And I think that when you, you know, connecting to our other theme, and I was very impressed with the the woman from Verizon 
having those images out there of disabled leaders in any sector is something that we need to see more of. And Hollywood and television has a huge impact on those perceptions. So, I mean, for the leaders that we can identify, I think we need to do a better job of promoting them inside and outside the organization. So I really encourage um, support in that regard. Thank you. Fantastic, totally agree. And uh, it's a key reason why we wanted to do this session today because we know that there are, just as the amazing speakers we had today, there are a lot of fantastic women out there with disabilities in tech, and we, we wanted to be able to just, even in a little way, be able to just bring more visibility, and we're so glad that we have this recording that will be there on web TV for more people to see um, the incredible speakers and people um, that we had with us uh, today. So we want to say a huge thank you to you all, um, and and uh, we'll just give one last chance. Our, our dear colleagues who are joining from Kenya and UK, it's well past um, midnight, I think, for them. So if they had to drop off, we completely understand. Um, but is there anyone else online left who just want to give you the chance to, to have a final um, comment, if you wish? No? Okay, then we just wanted to reiterate our huge thanks to you all, um, all the lovely speakers who did such a great job today. Thanks for all the work you put into the great remarks. Thanks to our participants here. Thanks to those who are watching the webcast. And uh, thanks to those in the future who will be watching the recording. <laughs>